Uh, go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to John 1. And we're going to be beginning with verse 1 of John 1. We're going to be looking at the subject of how Jesus changes eternity. It's part of the sermon series, How Jesus Changed the World, How Jesus Changes Attitudes, The Way We Think, How Jesus Changes Nations, How Jesus Now Today Changes Eternity. And uh, then, of course, next week, how Jesus changes the future. What does the future hold for those who believe in Christ and for those who don't believe in Christ? And so I want to add my welcome to Matthew's welcome earlier to those of you who are here in person. Thank you so much for being here. For those of you who are streaming or listening by radio, you're our honored guest too. And we just want you to feel a part of the family here at South Main. You know, it's great uh, after the, the hustle and bustle of the season to just gather together for a time of kind of fairly informal worship. You know, we're not having our Sunday school small groups today. Uh, if you're, uh, if you're uh, there at home in your bathrobe, there's still no time to get to the 11 o'clock service. It's our more classic service, and, uh, and we are thankful for, uh, for that group as well. But we're all family here. You know, I was talking to my Sunday school small group a couple of weeks ago about the hustle and bustle of Christmas. Now, I know what hustle is, but I'm not sure I've ever bustled. So if somebody can help me out on that, uh, what does that mean? But we don't know. But uh, regardless of whether you've hustled or bustled or, or uh, just how your Christmas has turned out, whether weird Uncle Al made a scene at your get-together or not, we are here today to focus on Jesus Christ and to focus on this uh, coming year. Um, I don't know about you all, but I'm a big believer in New Year's resolutions. You know, a lot of preachers preach against New Year's resolutions. They say, you know, it's just, a, it's just a, a lifestyle that we need to live moment by moment for Jesus. But there's something about that new year that, uh, it, 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 that, uh, that kind of illustrates being born again. You know, if some of you are golfers, you know what a mulligan is or a do-over. Have you ever wanted like a do-over in life? And through Jesus, we get that do-over. We get, we get eternal life. We get to be born again, the Bible says. And, uh, and there's something about a new year that illustrates that. And so, um, so I've got a few things that I'm going to be working on in the coming year. I'm going to share a few of those with you next Sunday. So make sure Sure that you come or make sure that you stream our service or, or listen by radio. But today again, how Jesus changes eternity. I want to read a few verses to you from John chapter 1 of the Bible, beginning with verse 1, and then we're going to be skipping to a few other thing, uh, uh, verses in this, um, in this chapter. Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then skipping to verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came into his own, but his own received him not. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. And then going to verse 14, Then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory The glory of the only begotten Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And I pray God's blessing upon the reading of his word. This is a message today about the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's told in this chapter like an unfolding mystery. And it begins by talking about something or someone called the Word. What is the Word or who is the Word that this scripture speaks of? We find out later on in this chapter that the Word is God. And then we find out even later on in this chapter that this Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we figure out that it's Jesus, that it's Jesus. The first thing I want you to 
notice about the word is that um, in verse 1, the word was in the beginning. The Bible says in verse 1, in the beginning was the word. Remember during the Advent season, what I always said about Jesus. There never was a time when Jesus didn't exist. There never will be a time when Jesus doesn't exist. Many people think that Jesus was created or kind of, um, kind of uh, just was God, God made Jesus and uh, 2,000 years ago uh, he appeared on earth. Oh no, there never was a time when Jesus didn't exist. But he just made his advent into human history 2,000 years ago. His advent or his entrance into human history at Christmas. This is known as the doctrine of the pre-existent Christ. God is eternal in both directions. No beginning and no end. God is a line. He's not a vector. Jesus is a line. He's not a vector. And so, um, and so Jesus is God. One God who reveals himself in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Word was in the beginning with God the Father. And so secondly, now we learn that, uh, that, 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 that second truth. The Word was with God. The first truth, the Word was in the beginning in verse 1, but also in verse 1, the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And so from the beginning, there was a camaraderie, a relationship this one God who reveals himself in three persons, one God, three persons, in total harmony, in total relationship, in total camaraderie, the word was with God. Thirdly, also in verse 1, we um, learn that not only was the word in the beginning, the word was with God, but we learned that the word was God, was God. This word Jesus was God. One day earlier in, our, in my ministry, I was preaching at a small church, and I decided to do an experiment. And I asked the crowd, how many of you believe that Jesus is God? And I asked them to raise their hands. How many of you believe that Jesus is God? And I just waited for a minute, and hands went up, and then hands went down, and then hands went halfway up, and then people grimaced. But I want to leave no doubt this Sunday, Jesus is God. This is known as the divinity of Christ. Jesus is not a created being, as Anselm said uh, was hundreds and thousands of years ago. Jesus is not a creature. He's not a created being. He's God, one God who reveals himself in three persons. The doctrine of the divinity in, of Christ, and it's taught unmistakably in Scripture. Now, the fourth thing that we learn, skipping now to verse 2, is that the Word is a person. The Word is a person. He was with God in the beginning. And, and it's, it's, it's very disconcerting to me that, that, um, that lately I've heard more and more people speaking of God as an impersonal force and not as a personal being. God the Father is not an it. He is a he. Jesus the Word is not an it, but a he. Even the Holy Spirit in the Bible is referred to usually as a he. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, not an it. Many people teach that God is an impersonal force. How wrong they are. God is a being, a person, a person that you can know, as Matthew said earlier, a person whom you can pray to, commune with. You can know him personally. And Jesus made that possible 2,000 years ago when he made his advent into human history. Now, there's a fifth thing that we learn from this passage of Scripture, this unfolding mystery of the Word. What is the Word? Who is the Word? And the fifth thing that we learn is in verse 3. And, and it's this, through the Word, all things were made. Verse 3 says it this way, through Him, all things were made. This Word, 
Jesus was right there with God the Father in the beginning. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Father together in the beginning creating the universe with nothing but a word. This is uh, referred to as the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, which means creation from nothing. God had no building blocks. He spoke it into being like a computer programmer that has nothing, but he creates a world. And, uh, and uh, with, uh, with these, uh, these videographers and, and gamers that just create worlds. It, it's, um, God spoke it. God thought it into being. This is reinforced by other verses of Scripture. In Genesis 1, verse 1, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then in verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image. This is the doctrine of creation. That uh, God is not creation. We're not pantheists that worship the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees. God is separate from creation, but he is Lord over creation. He made it all. In Colossians chapter 1, we read more about the function of Jesus from the beginning of time. In Colossians 1, beginning with verse 15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him were all things created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So through the word, all things were made. One God, three persons, creator and sustainer of the world. Now, this unfolding mystery of the word of God in um, verse 4, there's a sixth Uh, a sixth truth and it's this in the word is life in the word is life reading in verse 4 in him the word Jesus was life we live in a culture of death we live in a culture that devalues life 50 million abortions, millions of women victimized by abortion. You know, they talk about a woman's right to choose. Uh, Let me tell you who likes abortion. Men like abortion. Frat boys like abortion. Child molesters like abortion. Abusive fathers that sexually abuse Their daughters like abortion, a culture of death. 50 million abortions, most for convenience, most for convenience. Euthanasia, the right to die, active euthanasia. Some people, it's not just um, somebody at the end of life getting morphine because they're so, they're they're in such pain. This is... uh, No, people that are depressed in Denmark have the opportunity now to go to a doctor and be be killed. The right um, to uh, to, uh, take your own life. You know, the problem is, um, the problem is uh, what's a right soon becomes an obligation. Uh, Grandma, isn't it time that you ended it all? Abortion, euthanasia crime the taking of property and life violence evolution we tell our young people that they're just an animal you're just an animal just like all the other animals here's a condom survival of the fittest preferred species of course leads to racism you know that that's 
That's Germany in the 1940s, social Darwinism. There were good groups, preferred groups, and there were groups that were not preferred, the gypsies and the Jews. And uh, the Nazis could murder millions of people and go to bed and sleep well, thinking that they had made the human race better. Handicapped people. Less preferred people. Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, was used to justify genocide. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to do it. Just uh, take your phones out. This may be important enough for you to take your phones out right now and just Google Origin of Species full title. Origin of Species, Darwin's book, full title. Look at the full title of, uh, of his seminal work on evolution. We need to bring Jesus back to bring life and respect and kindness and humility and civility back into our world. The word is life. Seventh, in verse 5, in the word is light. In verse 5, we read it this way. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Many people are worried and hopeless and they have despair and they're just so concerned about the darkness in our world. And then you look at the Bible and you see Jesus, the Word, that one shining light that dispels the darkness in an instant. One time our family, when I was a little kid, we took a, uh, took a vacation to Mammoth Cave, Kentucky with those miles and miles of caverns underground. Back then, some of them were still, had still been unexplored. And the guide uh, took us down Ma Mammoth Cave National Park. They had a guide. He took us down to the lowest part of the cave, miles away from the entrance. And uh, he, he said this. He said, most of you have never really experienced Total darkness. Total darkness. And he said, you close your eyes, but you close your eyes. Even, to, even in this room that's fairly dark, you can still see light. Um, even in the dead of night, there's still a street light or just something somewhere emanating light. Most of you have never really experienced total darkness. So I want to introduce that to you right now. And he turned off the lights. And we, miles underneath the earth, were overwhelmed by the most profound darkness I've ever experienced. But amazingly, the darkness is so weird. Amazingly, no matter how deep the darkness, one match dispels it. One match. One light. And though the world may be profoundly dark and scary to you, one light, Jesus can end that darkness in an instant. So trust in him. Follow his light. There's an eighth thing that I want you to notice in this unfolding mystery. And um, it's in verse 9. And it's this. Then the word came into the world. In verse 9 we read, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. So the power of Jesus to overcome the darkness is not just an abstract idea. It's not just a theological idea. He really did it 2,000 years ago. Jesus then came to earth. The true light came into the world. And we've never been the same. And that's why this Christmas sermon series on how Jesus changed the world. When Jesus came into the world, things changed. Blood sport and torture were eliminated from the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, hospitals were established, mostly Christian. Charities were formed. Nonprofit ministries were formed, mostly Christians. 
Women's rights were protected. You know that, that awesome verse in the Bible in Christ, there is no male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free. All are one in Christ Jesus. Slavery was abolished. Slavery was abolished. Abolitionism is a Christian construct. There, there's, some, there's some, you know, I, I told you a couple of weeks ago about the battle hymn of the Republic. You know, the, it's an abolitionist hymn. One of the verses, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. Though he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Our God is marching on. And, and even in one of our Christmas, um, even in one of our Christmas songs, O Holy Night, the abolitionists added added a verse of abolitionism back in the 1860s. Surely he taught us to love one another. His arms are hope and his gospel is peace. Chains will he break because the slave is our brother. And in his arms all oppression will cease. Slavery was abolished. The civil rights movement was a church-fueled movement of the black church. Everything good Everything good in our society and in the world emanates from that one solitary life, Jesus Christ. The Word came into the world. And uh, then that verse in the Bible from 2,000 years ago. Remember this verse was written not, not in the time that we have right now in the light, of the, in the, light of, the, of the Declaration of Independence and the freedoms we have in our country. Remember, this was written at a time when the Roman Empire, you know, one-third of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves, the plebe class. This was written at a time when, when one-third of the Roman Empire were slaves, the slave class. Uh, remember, this was written at a time when women were despised property in Judaism and they were exploited and horribly treated in the Roman Empire. But during this time of slavery and systemic oppression of women, the Bible boldly proclaims in Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Oh no, Jesus is not a theoretical light. The Word came into the world and changed it for all eternity. Somebody asked me the other day, you know, I'm, uh, you know I usually, uh, 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 about every Saturday or Sunday, will email around 91 pastors in our, in our region. And, uh, you know, our pastors get along well, you know, Men pastors, mainline pastors, Pentecostal pastors, Baptists, men, women, Hispanic, black pastors. We, we actually have a, a camaraderie. We, we are on an email to each other every, every Sunday morning or every, every Saturday night. And um, w- one of the pastors one day asked me about critical race theory, and I told him I don't know anything about that. To me, it sounds like a bunch of scholars in an echo changer, chamber at some university campus writing the latest textbook. But I will tell you this, at South Main, racial reconciliation isn't a theory. We live it. It's a reality. It's something we're engaged in every day. Every person we encounter, we welcome and treat them just like Jesus would. And so I would say to everyone on this issue, quit arguing about theory and start doing it. The real love of Christ, kindness, welcoming, sharing with everyone. The little hymn I learned in sunbeams when I was five years old needs to be recycled. Red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in his sight. Jesus Christ, the true light that gives light to everyone. Men, women, slave, free, Jew, Gentile. The true light is coming into the world and his name is Jesus Now, the ninth thing uh, that we learn in verses 10 and 11, we read that though the world did not recognize the word, that uh, he still came. 
And that's the, that's the next thing in our unfolding uh, mystery. The, the world didn't recognize the creator, didn't recognize the word, didn't recognize Jesus. He came into his own, but his own received him not. Even his own people did not receive Jesus and his message. And there, there it is right there in verses 10 and 11. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came into his own, but his own did not receive him. And this is no surprise. It was prophesied in Scripture hundreds of years earlier in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. There is a tendency of sinful man to always reject holy God. We want to go our own way, do our own thing, make our own decisions, live our life in our own power and in our own creativity and in our own ingenuity without a regard for God. That's what sin is, the middle letter I, the middle letter of pride, I. There's always a tendency to not want to follow our creator. How, how ironic. How ironic. Isaiah 53, he'll be despised and rejected. Um, no room at the end when he was an infant. Persecuted and driven to Egypt when he was a toddler. Misunderstood by the scribes and Pharisees when he was a young boy. And even his parents didn't understand him. A prophet without his honor in his own country when he was a man. Even at his death, his disciples failed him. Could you not watch with me and pray with me one hour? And even on the night that he was arrested, Peter denied him three times. He came to his own, and even his own received him not. And on this uh, Christmas and New Year's season, will you receive him? Or will you continue this, this, this pattern of people rejecting Jesus Christ? Oh, Jesus said in the word, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but straight or narrow is the way that leads to heaven and eternal life and few find it but that invitation to be saved is given to everyone and and the, the question is will you receive him is there room in your heart for jesus or will you reject him and oh by the way the devil will freely supply you with thousands of ways to reject jesus you know i used to think Rejecting Jesus was a bunch of lame excuses. Oh no, the devil will give you great excuses not to follow Jesus Christ. Not to follow Jesus Christ. Some of you are rejecting him through outright rebellion. Some of you reject him through apathy. You just put it off. Some of you reject him through procrastination. Not now. But if you keep saying not now, you're really, that's just a nicer way of saying never. Not now, not now, because you can only receive Christ in the now. Not now is the present tense of never. Through ignorance, people reject Christ. They haven't heard or they don't want to hear, make a commitment to read the Bible, find a good church where Christ is honored, where the Bible is preached, where everyone's welcome. And then, and then so, so ignorance or apathy or procrastination. And then some of you are rejecting him through outright uh, rebellion, outright rebellion. Represented in this room and in our streaming audience, in our radio audience or Probably some of the most scandalous, destructive, depraved activities. A lot of people are just nice people that reject Jesus through apathy. Or, but then there are some that are just 
Well, the Bible says it this way in Ephesians 5, 12. It is a shame even to speak of those things that are done of them in secret. And so some of you are on your way to a downfall of profound proportions if you do not turn and repent. That's why, that's why we have some really profound ministries to addiction and recovery ministries and homeless ministries and things like that because, because, um, because of the profound ways that people can grow apart from Jesus Christ. And not to mention, not to mention hell. Now, a lot of, a lot of preachers um, have taken hell out of the pulpit, but God has not taken it out of the Bible. Not to mention hell. Hell is a reality for people who die without Christ. Now, Everything in the Bible, to me, seems to indicate that this earth is the arena where you choose Christ. Where you make that decision for or against Christ. And there doesn't seem to be any other opportunities after we leave the arena of this, of this world. And, and, and uh, in the Bible, hell seems to be a reality for all who do not come to Jesus Christ, either by outright rebellion or passive indifference. And so maybe that explains why I get up here and yell and scream and sweat, because we are to proclaim to everyone, hey, there's another way. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. You don't have to wander about aimlessly. There's light and life. In Jesus Christ, God came to show you the way and you can be born again. You can have a do-over in life. Now, the tenth thing in this unfolding mystery um, is um, the good news that God is redemptive. He can give you a new beginning. Yet to all who received him, to those he gave, the power to be the children of God. Just open the door and ask him in. Revelation 3.20 as we close. <laughs> Jesus, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. Just open the door. A child can open the door. A man can open the door. A woman can open the door. An addict can open the door. A person harboring scandalous sins can open the door. And you can open the door right now and receive Jesus. All because the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that everything changes when you come into a life. People who are orphans become the child of God. People who are hell-bound sinners become saved. People who have lost direction get on the right path. And people who have failed and failed and failed get a new beginning. It's like being born again. And you, while your heads are bowed and while your eyes are closed, and those of you in our listening audience, do you need that new beginning today? The Bible says, receive him. And how do you do that? Well, you receive somebody into your house by just getting up and opening the door and saying, come in. And uh, it's the same way with Jesus as he stands at the door of your heart. You just simply say, Lord, come in. Let me lead you in a prayer if you need Jesus. Lord Jesus, I open the door of my life. I invite you in. Just pray that prayer to him. I open the door of my life. I invite you in to be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sins. And thank you for rising from the grave to defeat death for me. And now by faith I say thank you 
for saving me and giving me eternal life. Thank you for giving your blood for me on the cross and now help me always to live for you. To live for you. 